Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is my Friday Reads for the end of February and what a disappointing week I've had. I've read three books including a uh, long-listed book for a prize that was announced today. Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melchior. A Meal in Winter by Hubert Mingarelli. And Infinite Ground by Martin McInnes. So I'm going to start with Hurricane Season by Fernanda, Fernanda Melchior, translated by Sophie Hughes. This was today announced as one of the long lists for the Man Booker International Limited. It's on a usually favourite uh, publishing house of mine, Fitzcarraldo, but uh, this book, I'm afraid, uh, did not work for me on any level. So the basic plot is uh, a woman who is regarded as a witch in a Mexican... Uh, large village or small town is found dead and we get her backstory and the backstory of all the other characters involved with her uh, that may or may not be associated with the murder and uh, the book only has one pitch and that is shrill there's no light or dark in it whatsoever all the characters are hateful uh, wives hate husbands husbands hate wives Children hate their parents, parents are resentful of their children. Uh, I think it's supposed to be a commentary on, you know, what poverty drives people to. But if that's your point, you need shade, you need light and dark, and this is all, you know, all dark. Um, it's written um, in without any paragraph breaks, there's lots of run-on sentences, um, but it doesn't you know, it doesn't achieve anything. And in terms of comparison, so the notion of looking at the, uh, you know, concentrating the book on the killers uh, rather than the cops uh, is something that, say, the Norwegian novelist Karen Fusson does. And she does it so much better, so much nuance and, and complexity behind the psychology compared to this. Um, as I say, the problem is this is one-dimensional, one-toned. Um, and I have to say... Uh, another most distressing thing about this book is it now represents the fifth book that I've come across in the last three years, which has uh, the theme of humans having sex with dogs in it. And I think it was Sean, the book Maniacs, uh, Alphabet Soup Tag W is for, and one of the prompts was weary, what trope are you weary of? And I mentioned in that, and I'll post a link to that video, that, you know, I couldn't believe I'd read four books where there was uh, human dog uh, sex. And here's a fifth. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, this book had no redeeming features. To, and it also says on the back, written with an infernal lyricism that is affecting as it is enthralling. No, it isn't. You know, it, it did nothing with language. There was lots of re repetition of, you know, sort of insults and swear words. Um, but it's not like David Peace uses repetition and rhythm. Here, you know... My mother always said to me that, you know, swearing was the sign of having a bad vocabulary. But what this book made me realise is, is that the limited vocabulary is around swearing. There's actually very few ways of saying the same things over and over again. So, as I say, you know, not one redeeming feature about this. I gave this two stars. And I can't believe that it's been nominated. OK, uh, A Meal in Winter, Hubert Mingarelli, a French author. And this was translated by... Uh, Sam Taylor, who's a translator I've come across quite quite often. Uh, this was shortlisted for the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize. Uh, I don't know if that's the independent newspaper or the concept of independent. So this was the second book sent to me out of my subscription for Big Green Books, where I paid up front for a 12-month subscription, where I'd get a mystery book sent to me uh, once a month for 12 months. I gave them an outline of what I was interested in. This is the second by a French author and the second set in the Second World War. So I don't know quite how they've sort of uh, gleaned into that. The, the first one was The Order of the Day, and I'll post a link to that review. I thought it was good, but didn't teach me anything about the period I didn't know. This, yeah, um, OK, let me, let me tell you what this is about. So basically, three German soldiers in their platoon, um, and it's a platoon that rounds up and shoots Jews, in Poland, I should say. And, there's, you know, they, they can't face shooting Jews, so they sort of volunteer um, for the sort of the 
in a way, the prize uh, duty, which is to go out and hunt Jews down, to find them in the Polish countryside where they're hiding, to root them out. And they have a bastard of a, an officer who won't let them do it, so they go above his head and appeal to a more sympathetic officer, and they get the gig. They, so they start before dawn, they go without breakfast, and it's the, at the height of the Polish winter, it's absolutely freezing, there's snow and ice everywhere. So we get their sort of trek out into the countryside. And they're a tight-knit they're a tight knit unit, the three of them. You know, they're, they're good friends. And eventually they manage to track down a Jew, and uh, they're going to take him back. Uh, and on the way they find what is described as a Polish hovel, and they decide, because they haven't eaten all day, they're going to cook up some food that one of them has stolen from the, the German quartermaster stores. And a lot of this book, as per the title of Meal of Winter, is about the minutiae of how they have to improvise, because they, you know, there's how, what are they going to cook it in, what are they going to eat it from, how are they going to start a fire, etc, etc, etc. And that is the mass of this book. The Jew, they sort of put in a storeroom in the house, while they're sort of solving the issue of how to cook up their meal. And while they're doing it, a Polish guy comes in with his dog. And then we, you know, we get into a sort of... Um, uh, a sort of diagrammatic, because I can't, I can't think of any other way to say it, of, you know, the Pole hates the Jew, the Germans hate the Pole, the Germans are undecided about what their attitude towards the Jew is, because what they don't want... While they don't, you know, while they're sort of rounding them up is sort of OK. The fact that they didn't have to go and kill them, shoot them, is, is something that they're finding really hard to cope with. And it just sort of, you know, you get, as they sit down to have the meal and they're sort of sniping... The three Germans aren't sniping each other, but, you know, the Germans, the Pole and the, the Jew, there's some sort of choreography going on. But it's so leadenly done, you know, it's all spelt out. Every minutiae of that choreography is explained to you. It's, not, you know, there's nothing left to the imagination. And the payoff, the dilemma that one of the German soldiers faces, it's been absolutely foregrounded so heavy-handedly again throughout the novel that it's it's hardly surprising. It's it's you know. So given its subject matter, this book singularly failed to, to tug at any heartstring or make any moral point or do anything. As I say, most of it is about how these German soldiers you know, managed to rustle up their meal. <laughs> I just, it was appalling. It, there's nothing to this book whatsoever. Two stars. And on to the final book, Infinite Ground by Martin McGuinness, uh, which I saw Eric, um, Lonesome Reader, talk about. McGuinness has got a new, his second book out. And I went and looked it up and looked this one up. I thought, actually, I, I might be better off starting with this one. It's his first book. And of the three books I read today, this does have the most to recommend it. It is... An interesting read, it didn't work for me, but you know, there's more to admire about it than the other two. So, uh, a, a, it's set in, in Latin America, I think in Mexico or Colombia, it's, it's not clear. And um, a family are having a big celebration, a uh, family celebration in a restaurant. Uh, a grown up son goes to the bathroom and is never seen again. And a policeman is put on his case to, to track down what's become of him. And very early on, um, the policeman decides he's going to recreate a, a copy of uh, the man's uh, workstation and office in what's called the corporation. And as he's doing this, he realises that there's lots of actors are employed by the corporation. There are staff there, but there's lots of actors are employed which is never really explained quite satisfactorily. It also reminded me of Tom McCarthy's Remainder, which has both the notion of recreating down to the every last detail uh, uh, an urban environment and using actors. So that seemed a rip-off of that. But even allowing for that, this was the best bit of the book in the sense of with forensic precision and real tightness of writing, tightness of ideas, once he's rebuilt the office... Um, He's able to sort of track down the sort of the microbiology of things like cells that, you know, would have fallen off and got trapped in the, in the keyboard of the computer and things like that. And he has those um, forensically investigated by a medical expert. And she posits that there's, there's you know, either a parasite or a bacteria got into the missing guy. And that, you know, and, and that may have sort of, you know, affected his thinking, affected his brain. 
And up to that point, I was really engrossed. I was really with this book. But then it gets really woolly in its ideas, really open-ended in its writing. That, you know, complete move away from, from that forensic stuff. Where we get these ideas of it's all about missing people and planes that crash in the, in the, in the um, rainforest. People who are called into the rainforest who just walk out on their lives in a similar way. Although I'm not saying there's anything to do with sort of aliens, but close encounters of the third kind, where they in that film they kept hearing the musical tune calling them. There's something supposedly calling people here. There are scenes that you know that are they about solipsism or are they about uh, you know the the policeman himself sort of fading away and not existing and and himself becoming missing in the same way as Paul Oster's The New York Trilogy. So, for example, there he's on the street, there's this sort of crowd of people watching something, he can't see what it is, so he pushes his way through using his, his rank as a police officer, and then he finds there's no middle, there's no spectacle they're watching, there's no middle, the middle has not held. Um, but it's never explained what that's about. Or he's in a hotel in the rainforest, um, he's been interacting with the people who run the hotel and the guests. And there's a couple of nature documentarists there. He has interactions with them. This has gone on for a long time, you know, I don't know exactly how long, but it feels like months on end. And then he comes back from a trek into the forest and the, everybody's missing, vanished. Again, never really explained. As I say, is it solipsism that they never really existed? He's the only person that exists. His consciousness is the only one that has any kind of uh, sense perception. Or is it in fact that he's fading away and missing, that maybe he was the guy who walked out in the restaurant or is affected in the same way by the case, has driven him to sort of become missing himself? It's it's completely unclear. It's, it, as I say, it's woolly, it's open-ended, it doesn't offer any, any conclusions, just a lot of theories which don't really hang together. Uh, it reminded me in that sense, although I think uh, of Lachlan Bloom's book, The Wave, and that's the point, that the books it reminded me of, such as The End of Mr. Y by Scarlett Thomas, The Way by Lachlan Bloom, The New York Trilogy by Paul Oster, and Remainder by Tom McCarthy, are all far superior books to this. And that's the problem. Um, they were much more coherent. You know, they had these strange ideas, but they explored them in a much more joined up way than this did, which sort of almost sort of splattered them against the wall and see what sticks. So it's a shame because I'm now really undecided as to whether I want to read his next book, the one that's just come out, because he can clearly write, he has good ideas, but if it's going to be woolly and open-ended as that, I have no interest in it. If it's going to be tight like the forensic first part of this book was, then I will pick it up. So I don't know. So if anyone reads his follow-up book, which I now can't remember the name of, uh, and they recommend it to me, I'd be very grateful. Equally, they might put me off. OK, uh, so that was it, really. A really tough, tough week. Oh, I should say I'm giving this three stars. And the reason I'm giving it three stars is because I really did enjoy the, the sort of the opening to the book. But then it, it kind of went off message, really, for me. So, uh, Hurricane Season, two stars. A Meal in Winter, two stars. And Infinite Ground, three stars. Here's hoping for a better week next week. It's already shaping up better because the next book I've picked up is uh, Jim Thompson's the Killer Inside Me, I'm about two-fifths of the way through that, and that is a much more satisfying read. Uh, that book was sent to me by Mitchell Axler, uh, and he hasn't sent me a, a dad yet, so uh, here's hoping, book two, for a better reading week. Till then. <laughs>